Christine Maple, born Christine Raphael, born November 16, 1912, dying January 13, 1947, at the age of 34, was an American actress in the 1930s who appeared in Western films and serials. She was a skilled horseback rider, likely learned from her Kansas childhood, and dancer. She was a Ziegfeld Follies girl and one of the few Follies girls you can catch on screen today. Her career collapsed and she had health issues in the 1930s. Eventually, she moved to Langhorne, Pennsylvania and worked in a department store. Her life ended tragically in her Philadelphia townhome. The city of Philadelphia has no plaque or remembrance of this woman despite her life in Philadelphia and her antics in Philadelphia train stations. Hers is a cautionary tale of nudity and beauty. Maple was born in Belle Plaine, Kansas. Her parents divorced and she lived with her mother who remarried and moved to Los Angeles. Christine started competing in beauty pageants and was a finalist in the Elks National Convention Bathing Beauty Contest. In 1930 she made her film debut in the Charlie Chase short 50 Million Husbands. She signed a contract with Republic Pictures in 1936 and appeared in four films including the westerns The Big Show and Roarin', Lead. In the latter, she was the female lead alongside the three Mosquitas. The El Paso Times published a summary of her breakdown in the late 1930s. Perhaps it's a thin line, after all, which divides the bubbling, youthful prank from the careening of a sick mind through the fog of nervous breakdown. Christine Maple of the Golden Hair was just as lovely and buoyant when she took her wild, penniless taxi ride through Los Angeles the other day as she was when she wore evening gowns in New York in the morning, or threw the book at a Swiss train conductor's head. The difference was this. For her earlier escapades, young, pretty Christine got only tolerant chuckles from her friends and admirers and a few scowls from the constabulary. But in those days, Christine was the madcap folly's beauty with the bloom of Flo Ziegfeld's Miss Universe title upon her. Not long ago, when Christine hailed a taxi upon reaching Los Angeles by boat and rode aimlessly and hysterically through the city, refusing to pay the $6.10 bill, she landed not in jail, but in the psychopathic ward of the General Hospital of Los Angeles. Her own parents agreed to the treatment as the taxi driver sought recompense for his unpaid bill. The searing, Roman candle flight of Christine's gaudy, mundane star had burnt and ended in a damp fizzle of dread psychosis. The party was over. Another of Broadway's pampered Venuses, with an internationally spectacular career, had come to a grey impasse. Christine was an almost incredibly beautiful and perfectly formed girl. The folk tales of many lands imply beauty bears a curse. The hot flame of her own loveliness seems to have seared Christine. Broadway still discusses her first startling collision with convention. The Follies Company was on tour and its train drew up into the North Philadelphia station. If it had drawn up today the company would have likely been attacked as a man was murdered in a Philadelphia Scepter station last week, over a fight over a lighter. Christine, in a spirit of pure, mad caprice, suddenly appeared on the platform absolutely nude. She paraded up and down before the horrified or fascinated eyes of the natives, a lady godiva with no horse and bobbed hair. That was a starter. Philadelphia would later be home to Christine. Back in New York, Christine took a large and very gay party to the Chapeau Rouge, Pepe de Albru's swanky nightery. They ate, drank and made merry all evening, but when the waiter presented a bill, Christine widened her limpid eyes and expostulated. Why Pepe invited us all to be his guests, didn't you Pepe Darling? Pepe Darling denied this, with some heat, that he had extended any such invitation. In fact, he pointed out, no cabaret could make money entertaining parties as large as that, on the cuff. He was afraid he'd have to sue if Miss Maple persisted in misunderstanding. Miss Maple did persist. Mr. de Albru sued and collected. So money problems followed Christine. But Christine's most marked and remarked eccentricity was her fondness for low-cut evening gowns in the morning and Tweedy Sports attire at night, almost a total flip of morning and evening wear. She said that the couturiers all seemed to be out of step with her. That obviously décolletage was the very thing for sunny mornings along Park Avenue. Perhaps she was trying to catch the attention of a wealthy beau. Then she went abroad. Accustomed to crazy Americans, the Europeans regarded Christine as simply an exaggerated type. 
In Monte Carlo, she had what was perhaps her most romantic adventure of all. Enrique Madrigora's orchestra filled nightly with dreamy or jazzy tunes. Enrique, darkly handsome young Spanish grandee, former child prodigy and cousin of former King Alfonso VIII had been playing straight to Christine. Their eyes held while his violin sang. Suddenly there was a disturbance. Christine was the center of a rumpus. Some said a waiter had inconsistently presented the folly's beauty with her pet phobia, a bill. Others, including Christine, alleged that a group of waiters had ganged up on her to do her bodily harm for no good reason. Enrique Madrigora was the handsome Spanish orchestra pilot, ten years her senior, who rescued fiery Christine from a corps of angry waiters who wanted to toss her out. Madrigora would never marry. When Enrique spied the threatening circle of men around the pretty girl, he advanced to a lady in distress. Unfortunately, Enrique was a playboy who may have made Christine's mental health worse with his presence. Gay Delise, another Broadway butterfly who met handsome Enrique Madrigora at Monte Carlo, sued him for breach of promise and ended her brief footlight carer in slow convalescence at a Denver lung sanatorium. Delise was not related to Gabby Delise, who you can learn about on this channel. But Christine was a bit romantically grateful to him. At this point, Christine's meeting with Madrigora, her trail as it was crossed that of another beautiful Broadway chorus line headed just as surely as was Christine for eventual tragedy, and with the same man. Gay Delise's loveliness had won her instantaneous acclaim in the chorus of a luminous Broadway nightclub, and from there she had gone to that romantic chorus, Monte Carlo Follies. Gay met Enrique in the same room. Later she sued him for $100,000 for breach of promise, ostensibly to marry her after, after she slept with him. Women could do that back then. Now Gay is regaining her health after months in a sanatorium. Her suit never came to trial and she settled within reek out of court. Next, we find Christine on a Swiss train. Christine propped her shapely foot up on her compartment radiator. In popped the stern conductor to plop Christine's foot down again. Furious, she seized the first handy missile and flung it at the trainsman's head. It happened to be a book she was reading and a weighty tome at that, Antony Adverse, one of the longest books ever written at 1,272 pages. Perhaps she was reading it in hopes of attaining a movie part for its 1936 film adaptation. As it was, Christine was seized by burly gendarmes at the next stop and hustled off to jail in 1933. She later claimed that she bounced and bruised and slapped around unmercifully. She was released, on payment of a small fine, lodged a characteristically vigorous protest with the American Council, and returned angrily to America where Hollywood agreed to hire her in more westerns. Back home, people told her she looked like European movie star Anna Stern and she ought to be in pictures again as the American look-alike. The resemblance was really remarkable, her friends pointed out and would be utterly amazing except for one little facial line where Christine's nose joined her forehead. What friends were these? How lucky or unlucky then that her most admirer of the moment, to whom the columnists reported her engaged, was the wealthy Dr. Morton L. Burson, plastic surgeon in waiting to Broadway. Fifteen years her senior, Dr. Burson lived until 1973 at 11 East 60th Street. Unfortunately for Christine, Burson was the author of a heavily illustrated book on plastic surgery, The Atlas of Plastic Surgery, and may have included Christine in the book for all to see. Christine gave her boyfriend a blueprint of the alterations she wanted done. And he went to work with artistic passion to chisel her already lovely nose to be more like Anna Stern's. But Christine's butterfly day was blowing up a storm after her surgery. Perhaps something else had happened on the operating table. She began to tell everybody she met her long-lost father in England and he had turned out to be a duke. Was this a replacement for the father her mother divorced? He had introduced her to all the crowned heads of Europe and she had driven them to distraction with her charms. Did Christine think with her new nose she could reinvent herself totally? All her friends knew her parents, Mr. and Mrs. J. B. Maple, which was her mother and stepfather, were living in happy obscurity together in Los Angeles. Then Christine began to put her remodeled nose into books. She swore she was a literary genius, perhaps trying to walk in the steps of her author boyfriend. She said she was at work on the great American novel. 
In the matter of costume, she wore gingham house dresses to the swankiest of nightclubs. With Christine Maple, we see this desire for what she wants in her clothing. When she wanted a wealthy lover, she dressed up. When she wanted to settle down and write a book, she wore house dresses. In 1933, the wife of millionaire Martino de Alzaga Unzu accused her of being too friendly with her husband. She made headlines in April of 1935 when she got into a fight with a cab driver after refusing to pay her bill. Her mother said she had that first big nervous breakdown and sent her to a sanitarium. Christine signed a contract with Republic Pictures in 1936 and appeared in the Westerns The Big Show and Roarin's Lead. She went to Australia in 1938 to appear in a stage production of The Women. Unfortunately, she had to leave the show when she became very ill. She suffered another nervous breakdown and had to be hospitalized in 1943. Women constantly becoming naked for profit can cause severe issues with self-esteem and the normalization of abuse. Sex work or sex work adjacent activities also correlate with delusion in women as they see themselves as objects instead of as people. Five years of continuous and greedy drinking form the cup of Broadway were taking their toll. Acquaintances shrugged and puzzled, this behavior from a woman in her thirties was no longer cute. What is the subtle point at which carefree exuberance merges into a thing more grim? Perhaps Christine was comparing herself to other Ziegfeld girls such as her friend Virginia Bruce. Bruce moved steadily upwards in films while Christine floundered. Christine left them wondering when she took the boat for Los Angeles, arriving there to take her strange, rambling taxi ride with its pitiful outcome in the psych ward. Now she's been transferred by permission to the authorities and her parents to a private sanitarium, seemingly the St. Mary Medical Center of Bucks County, Pennsylvania. It is renowned for treating medically complex patients. Was Christine really medically complex? The original St. Mary Hospital was opened in Philadelphia in 1860 after inspiration from the Sisters of St. Francis. The tradition of Christian orders helping medically cannot be understated. The hospital moved to Bucks County in opening a new hospital on land previously used as a horse farm. Christine lived at 334 Fawn Street in Philadelphia, where she ended her life by hanging in 1947 at the age of 34. Her body was cremat and her family received her ashes. Broadway and Hollywood are seldom motherly, but in Christine's case there has been much the same pity as is felt for a madcap child who played too hard. Her ashes were given to her family.